Paul had been a witness to the martyrdom of Stephen. Stephen had been a deacon within the early church and they uh, stoned him for some of the comments that he made about Jesus being the fulfillment of all the temple uh, services. Saul was a witness. He stood by the side of those who cast their stones at Stephen and he observed him uh, fall underneath the, the battery of those stones. And as Stephen was there, he said, I see him standing in heaven. He saw the Christ, Jesus. That did not impress Paul. He went from that place, by this, at this time he was named Saul. He went from there and with letters from the Sanhedrin, he went about Judea and even as far as Damascus to put into prison those who believed in Jesus. He would bring them to trial where witnesses would be drawn against them and uh, have them put in prison or even put to death. It was on one of those trips that Saul was on his way to Damascus and on that road a bright, bright light shone above him and a voice sounded from the heavens, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And so suddenly, Paul's life changed dramatically. On the one hand, he was going off to take uh, those who were professors of the way, who followed Jesus as the Christ, he was taking them off to prison. Now he personally, himself, met with the risen Lord. And he knew that he had risen from the dead. His life was changed. His experience, dramatic as it was, has been replicated in the church at large. It was the same experience of the early disciples when they saw Jesus risen from the grave and standing before them in that upper room, presenting to them his hands and his side, saying to Thomas, put your fingers in my hands and be not unbelieving. The disciples were changed from a group of men who were scared to death that they would be next. They were hiding up in an upper room with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. They were transformed such that within 40 days, Peter was standing out in the marketplace in Jerusalem proclaiming Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. And the church took off after that. How do you explain that change? The change in Paul, the change in the disciples, the change in the church, the change that has been ongoing throughout history, the change that works itself in your heart and your life as you come to faith in Christ and you have a new power at work within you. How do you explain that? There's only one explanation. Jesus Christ, who was crucified on that cross, died there. He was buried to certify that he was in fact dead. But on the third day, in spite of the guard set at that tomb, he rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples in the very same body which he took, which uh, went into that tomb. He arose. And so today we say, he is risen. And the church says in response, he is risen indeed. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, addresses a congregation that was struggling with doubts. They did not seem to doubt too much the resurrection of Christ. It seemed to be uh, amply validated. There are many witnesses to that. What they doubted was whether there would be any resurrection of the dead thereafter. Whether you and I would rise from the dead. And so Paul, in this 15th chapter, really strives to answer that question. Will we also rise from the dead? And what kind of body will we have in that great day? And the argument that Paul will make is that our confidence in our own resurrection is rooted in the resurrection of Christ. Because He rose from the grave, we too will rise. By the same token, by necessary logic, if He denied that we will rise from the dead, 
then you must also deny that Jesus himself rose from the grave. They go together. They are bound inextricably. The one implies the other. If Christ rose, then we will rise. If we will not rise, Christ did not rise either. You can't have it both ways. And so Paul addresses the church at Corinth and argues for the resurrection of Christ. And really, he doesn't argue it so much as assert it. He asserts that which they have received and accepted. And you need to understand he is writing within about 20, 25, maybe 30 years at most after the death and resurrection of Christ. Within the first generation of that resurrection, he is writing to the Christian church in Corinth, speaking to them of those things which all the church has received and accepted by this time. Everyone who was a believer in Christ understood that he rose from the dead bodily. This is not in question. There is no argument here. Paul uh, reminds us of some of the witnesses that testified to that. We'll look at that in a moment. But first, let me highlight what Paul says about the, the connection of the resurrection of Christ and the gospel message itself. What he begins by saying is that the Christian faith is rooted to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The whole of Christian faith rests on that resurrection. And if Christ is not raised, then our faith is worthless. He puts it all on the line. A bodily resurrection of Christ from the grave after being buried, seen and observed by many different witnesses. If that isn't true, then all of Christian faith collapses. And any attempt today in, in modern theology to reinterpret the resurrection, to, to say that it was a resurrection in the people's minds, resurrection of people's thoughts, their mythology, their, their symbolism, these kinds of things, completely destroys Christianity, destroys the hope of the gospel, destroys your salvation, destroys your hope of everlasting life. It's all gone. Because it's nothing but a myth. You might as well be watching Batman or Superman. It's nothing more than that. Paul says he, the gospel that he received, that he passed on to this congregation, was that Jesus Christ, the Christ, was crucified and was buried. Note, Paul says Christ, not Jesus. It's important to note, there's an intention there. Many people might not question whether Jesus died or that he died on the cross. That happens to many folks. Many people die. Some people have died on the cross. Paul identifies him as the Christ. The one who is anointed by God to be the Messiah of his people. The Deliverer. You might know that afterwards many in the Gnostic sect and these kinds of things began to think that the Christ really didn't die. The Christ was with him for, with Jesus for a period of time and then left him. Jesus died. Jesus was not important. That's not the case for Paul. The Christ took on our humanity, went to that cross and died. You know the gospel accounts. It was certified that he was dead. The soldiers who were in the business of executing people put a sword or a spear through his side, pierced his heart. His side bled great drops of blood and water. He was dead. And then he was wrapped up and put in that tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. A huge stone was rolled over the surface of that tomb. One man was not going to push that, that stone away. And certainly not a man who had just been crucified. Left for dead in the grave. I don't care how cold the tomb was, he's not going to revive and have the strength to push that stone away. It's ridiculous. Admit it. It's silly. But then, to suggest that something else came along, maybe some of the disciples came and snuck him away, well, what were the disciples doing? They were running for their lives. 
They were concerned that they were next. Further, there was a guard posted at that tomb, Roman soldiers, and that tomb was sealed to secure the fact that the body was still in there. What happened? The stone couldn't keep him. The Roman guard couldn't keep him. Death couldn't keep him. Satan couldn't keep him. Jesus rose from that grave. He walked through this tomb, through the walls, past the soldiers, and appeared to his disciples. First to the women, to Mary, Mary Magdalene, and the other women, and then to the disciples. The testimony of the gospel accounts to the death of Christ are quite clear. He died and was buried. But he also rose again in that same body. Now, excuse me, before I get to the resurrection, note as well that Paul says that Christ died for our sins. It wasn't just the death of a spiritual leader or a moral teacher or a revolutionary. It was the death of the Christ who came for a salvific mission, who came to save us from our sins. So his death was designed to remove sin. In the backdrop is the Passover. Passover lamb being slaughtered. And the angel of death passing over the people of God. Jesus was that Passover lamb slain for us. He was the lamb of the temple that went into that holy place and offered his blood shed for the sins of the people. Jesus came to die to remove sins. And that is what he accomplished by his death. It was an atoning death, removing God's wrath, God's justice, just sentence against us for our sins. And so Jesus died. He had to die. Because that was the penalty for our sins. Paul goes on to say that he rose on the third day. And all of this according to the scriptures. The scriptures themselves foretold all these events. They foretold his death. You're very familiar with Isaiah 53. Uh, the, the, the one who took on our punishment, our stripes, and by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah tells the suffering servant of the Lord who comes into this world to lay down his life for his people. Uh, all the Old Testament tells us of the death of Christ, Psalm 22, almost goes in minute detail of the experience of Christ hanging on that cross. Read the psalm for yourself. The resurrection. The scriptures testify to the resurrection over and over again. You have explicit statements in Psalm 16 where David says that... Um, he would not see his, the Lord would not allow his body to see decay, but he would rise and see life. Peter quotes that psalm in his Pentecostal sermon, using it to prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The scriptures testify to that resurrection. But you look at all the Old Testament scriptures, they over and over again testify to the resurrection of the Christ. You say, where? In many of the types and symbols of the Old Testament. Look at Abraham. Paul uses this in Romans chapter 4, arguing about Abraham and Sarah, two elderly adults to whom God had promised that they would have a child, and yet they were well beyond the age of conceiving and bearing children. And yet in these two who were, as Paul says, as good as dead, they believed in the God who brought life out of nothing. And God raised them and empowered them in such a way that they gave birth to a son named Isaac. Death, resurrection, typified in that little birth. That same child, many years later, will be taken by Abraham up to Mount Moriah where Christ himself will be crucified. And he was told to put that son of his on an altar and to slay his son. But what does the writer to the Hebrews say about this in Hebrews 11? Abraham went to that mountain, put his son on the, the altar, takes up those knife to slay his son in the faith that God could even raise the dead. And he received Isaac, his son, back as a type of the Christ. God showing that his Christ must suffer, die, 
and be raised again. Isaac would not suffer that because he himself was not the Christ. But symbolically, uh, in picture form, if you will, in typology, he showed us what God would do for us in Christ. Isaac's grandson, Joseph, was rejected by all of his brothers. They, were, they wanted to kill him. This was the boy that had the many colored uh, coat. He was the favorite of his father, the youngest of his brothers, next to the youngest. They were so upset with him, they wanted to kill him. Well, they decided against that. They took him out of the pit that they dug for him and sold him into slavery to Egypt, thinking that they were done with him. Like Pilate, they washed their hands of the matter. They were done with him. He goes into Egypt, which might as well be dying for Joseph. That was the end of his life with his family and his own land. And what happens to him? He serves in that family of Potiphar for a period of time. And then he's charged falsely, thrown into prison. Dying again, if you will. But does he stay in that prison? No. In an amazing way, God, by his revelation, brings Joseph out of that prison in Egypt and he becomes Lord of all of Egypt. Death, resurrection, ascension, lordship. Right there. And you can go through the scriptures. Uh, David, uh, Psalm 18, speaks of this in this great prayer. He cries out to God. He's fallen under the, the rivers of death. And he's been swept under the torrents of evil. And he cries out to God up above. And then God comes rushing on the clouds and the winds. And reaches down to his servant. Pulls him up out of the water like Peter out of the water long ago. And puts him on the solid ground. Death and resurrection. All the scriptures testify that, that Christ would suffer, be buried, and rise again on the third day. One final example. Jonah, the rebellious prophet, <coughs> leaves the Lord's will and goes off to a ship, on a ship to Tarshish. But what happens to him? God doesn't want him to go to Tarshish. So he sends a whale. He's swallowed up by that whale. Goes into the waters. Goes down below him. Basically dies in a figurative form, but then the whale spits him out on the third day. Jesus himself uses this story as an example, as a sign to the people of this day. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be. The scriptures over and over again testified that the Christ must rise again from the dead. And so when Paul declares that the Christ is risen, he has all the scripture to join him in that testimony. Christ is risen, just as the scriptures have said. So you can rest in that. All of this occurred as God's word had said. And if you question the resurrection, or would suggest that, well, the resurrection was designed by the disciples many years later when they tried to fit it all together, make sense of it all, well, you've got a whole history of theology pointing to a resurrection, life from the dead. While this is in my mind at the moment, I'll say it, because <laughs> I may forget it later. All of history and time points to the resurrection. Think of this season of the year that we're in. The seasons of the year, spring, summer, you have this beautiful hyacinth of flowers and so forth, and then fall, things begin to decay and die. You get into winter, winter, and the trees look like they're dead. And what happens? Resurrection. Springtime. New life. Trees bud. Birds sing. All kinds of good things happen. Everything around us points to the resurrection. Everywhere. In this game, you can go to the movies. You'll find it over and over again there. The great story is that the hero suffers, dies, or comes close to death for the cause that he loves, and then in the end, triumphs, and comes out stronger than before, and usually walks off with <laughs> somebody. But anyway, it's this great victory, isn't it? Death, sufferings, resurrection. All of culture tells us of this. Christ is risen. <clears throat> Paul then finally records the witness of the church. 
Many different disciples give testimony to that which God has done. He appears first to Cephas. Cephas who uh, gave this great testimony but, uh, uh, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, but then who also himself was one of the first to run away and deny Christ. He appeared first to Cephas, then to the rest of the twelve. You remember the gospel stories. And then to 500, many of whom, Paul says, are still alive at this time. In other words, you can ask them, what did you see? When did you see it? What happened? There were many witnesses, witnesses that all saw this, all at the same time or at different times, different locations, different situations. The men on the road to Emmaus, the disciples in the upper room, these 500 people, uh, Paul finally on the road to Damascus. Many different circumstances, many different situations, but Jesus appeared bodily. Remember him saying to Thomas, put your fingers in the holes of my hands, thrust your hand into my side, and know that it's me, this same Jesus. This Jesus ate bread and fish on the shore of Galilee with the disciples, this resurrected Jesus. He had a real body. It could be touched. It's different, straight form, but the same basic body. Many, many witnesses, credible witnesses, witnesses who went to the grave, suffered all kinds of things because of their faith in the resurrection of Christ. Were they deluded, deceived? I don't think so. You look at their testimony, they're very credible. Who do you believe? Scriptures of the Old Testament, witness of the church, many occasions, many places, that transformed the lives of the church throughout the centuries. As Paul said, I pass on to you that which I also have received. And through the history of the church, you have this baton passed from one generation to the next. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. It just goes on through history as a great chorus. He is risen. He is risen. And the whole church and all the world rises up and says, He is risen. He is Lord. He is King. He is alive. That changes things. He's changed us, made us new, given us a new life. He calls us to live for Him. Has it changed you? Do you know that you believe in Jesus? Do you receive this gospel of Christ? Do you accept Him as the Scriptures describe Him, as the one who takes away our sins by His death on the cross? By His resurrection, He shows that we are justified in God's sight. There's no more penalty for sin. It's fully paid for. We have a righteousness that is complete and perfect in Him. Do you rest in this Jesus? Do you understand the significance of His resurrection? Do you have confidence that you too will rise from the grave? the end of history and time. Let me conclude with this. There's so much more that could be said. I performed a number of funerals. Funerals for the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> uh, I performed funerals for people I didn't know. And, and for some who were dear saints. And one of the things that I've done, particularly with those uh, whom I knew, is after the service is over and after folks have said their goodbyes and folks have perhaps laid some flowers on the casket and walked away, and people are gathering at the cars, I stand by that casket and wait till everyone's gone. Then I take a moment to put my hand at the head of the casket, or perhaps kneel by, by the side of the gravesite and pray, Lord, remember this one when you come. We will rise again. This life is not all that there is. There's a coming resurrection when you and I will rise from our graves and ascend into glory and meet these 500 witnesses. Meet Paul, Cephas, and the rest of the apostles. Meet Jesus, the one who triumphed over sin and death for us. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Thank you.
Father in heaven, we thank you for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, how he triumphed over sin and death. And we pray, O oh God, that you would persuade our hearts and minds to rest in him, in the provision of salvation that he has made. We pray that you'd help us, strengthen us to receive it in faith, and to rest in that which you have done, and to live by your grace, serving you. We ask it in Jesus' name.